Hey, Greg, welcome. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Absolutely, yeah. Glad to get you on, and um, I appreciate you taking time away from the, the chickens and the goats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they usually need me more at dawn and dusk. It's, uh, it's a hard life. Uh, for some context, uh, right before we kicked off, Greg had uh, mentioned in the chat that he, uh, and you do actually have chickens and goats, uh, I think, at your your house uh, or home, right? I, I, I do. In, in addition to a little bit of Power BI work, I am also the owner of Black Cat Acres, a small farm in New Jersey. Nice. Okay. Okay. Very cool. It's. Uh, I'm assuming that's something that um, uh, keeps you occupied, and this is, I'm assuming something you enjoy quite a lot as well. It is, yeah. They say you got to diversify. I figure tech and farming are about as far apart as you can get. Your your stock is literal chicken stock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, but yeah, I've uh, I'm glad to finally get you on. I know that um, between uh, LinkedIn, social media, and then some of the Slack groups that we're in, you've uh, you've had quite a lot of knowledge, uh, especially technical um, knowledge on a lot of uh, areas of Power BI, DAX, and code in general. So I'm interested to do somewhat of a deep dive on a, on a topic that you're interested in today so i'm glad to have you on for that yeah definitely it's uh it, it's all hard one I, this is actually going to be my dax decade year so i'm pretty excited about that okay there you go um do you want to give a little bit of context about that sure i've uh yeah. i've been using power bi in some form or another for a decade this year uh starting with power pivot uh before power bi was even a twinkle in anyone's eye I uh, have been in consulting for most of that time, leading analytics teams, leading large scale projects uh, for uh, some of the largest analysis services customers in the world. I also did a brief stint on the dark side with AWS. And now I've uh, partnered up with a colleague and uh, we've founded Argus PBI and we're trying to simplify Power BI operations. It's something that I think is certainly needed more and more considering the, it's like a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, in the last two to three years, we've gotten a lot of enterprise features to allow for uh, highly configurable environments for customers to make sure that it's they're not overpaying and, and they're, they're optimized for whatever business need is required. But it, it also is increasing the requirements for tools and experts to ensure that it's properly configured. When you, when you have two buttons, it's easy to know which one to press for the most part. <laughs> you can look at a blog to make that determination. When you have a thousand buttons and dials to, to press and turn, it starts to get a little harder for our customers to self-teach themselves how to how to do that, regardless of how many blogs or articles are read. Uh, also, just having to turn all those dials every single day manually can, can become um, very cumbersome for a lot of people. So I think there there's both the need for the expertise, but then also tools to allow for some type of management and automation of this uh, at a higher level to, to at least observe when the dials need to be turned, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the... The last point you made there, when the dials need to be turned, is something that is definitely lacking in Power BI. There are a few things we can get email notifications about, but generally, you have to know what you did to know what is there now. That's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, to a degree, uh, know in the past to, to be able to predict the future. <laughs> well, not just uh, predict the future, but things as simple as saying what exists. Uh, there's yeah. not a, a good unified way to say what data sources do we use in the organization or what what workspaces simply exist. And there are, there are things in the Power BI service, and we can take a look at some of them today, that allow you to do some level of operational monitoring. But there are mm -hmm. certainly a lot of gaps, and certainly none of it is automated or delivered in one place for you in Power BI. The the only thing that really does it, and I'm uh, I'm sure there's there's similar reasons you spun up um, what you are, are now doing with, uh, it's um, Ar Argus, correct? Argus, yeah. yep. Uh, the only foot really in the game for the most part um, up until now has been Power BI Sentinel that Alex Whittles um, creates, which is provides a number of features that should be built into the portal. Uh, but that's that's the closest to like a, a true admin portal that you can get for any kind of monitoring. Um, my personal favorite of that is just the auto backup. You don't have to worry about um, each single team uh, version controlling the files. You can mm -hmm. at least connect to it, connect it to blob storage. You flip a switch and then it automatically copies and, and dumps every single data set and artifact from the service into there uh, automatically, which is really convenient. But 
I mean, you, you, it's essentially ha it has to be third party vendors that, that are stepping in to provide these just because there's a need for them out there. And um, as nice it would be to have it built in and Microsoft's getting better with it. There's still a lot of uh, gaps that can be filled of um, more, uh, more intuitive and just easy to manage um, overviews of, of your environment to know where problems are even to begin with, you know, let alone being able to, to just have a, a clean audit of what's being connected to what exists and everything in between. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, backup management is one of the traditional operational concerns of any software application. And like you said, it, it is typically up to third parties with Microsoft to step in and provide solutions to operational needs on their platforms. And one of the narratives that Microsoft has pushed, and not just Microsoft, it's the industry at large, is that if we use a software as a service product, we can step away from operational concerns and we don't need them. We don't need an operations team. We don't need to understand operations anymore. And bluntly, that's a lie. The, the truth with software as a service products is that it does allow you to focus on higher levels of operations, but backups are pretty basic. So we don't get to get rid of that many levels of the operational overhead of any solution. We don't have to manage Power BI servers necessarily but backups are still pretty basic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the, just having basic history uh, of, of files is, and I, I still have conversations to this day with clients where you go in and um, the the files, the files are backed up, but it's on a personal OneDrive, not a, mm -hmm. not a shared channel drive. So like that's, you know, flag number one is like, hey, if that person leaves you, delete their account, they're 60 days later, their files are gone or what, whatever that, that setting is for auto deletion um yeah. or the people who still like <laughs> report report one report 1.1 1.1.1.1 point one point one and well it, i'm there's just a bunch I'm a of fan of yeah 1.1.1 1. 1. 1. underscore final underscore really really final underscore <laughs> yep. as of february yeah yep uh it's still amazes me the number of times that i see clients and customers do do those practice and it, it, it's a hard muscle memory to get rid of sometimes because they're when you just look at that one file and you know and i've had to show people like no right click check it out version history uh like oh i thought it just synced to the click i didn't realize that was even there um so there's a bit of education and also you know that you have to get safe and comfortable with it when you can see 18 files in a folder it feels safer than just like one file with hidden version history because it's not as obvious if you're not used to the technology so i, I get sometimes the, the pain of the transitions but it is like we you know, if you copy and if you move that file to a different location or you, you copy and paste, you lose the lineage. Like, so the version history mm -hmm. is nice because it has a clean pipeline of all of the history that goes back, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's OneDrive or Dropbox or anything else. But yeah, I've, I've had to slap the hands of, of, of clients occasionally, you know, we're going to start doing it this way. We're going to have the <laughs> check-ins and then checkouts. We're going to have version histories. You can also, like, at least with SharePoint, there was ways to you know, to put notes every time you checked in a file so you can even make a comment on exactly what changed in that build um at, at, a, at a minimum if you're not using github or uh, azure devops and um shout out to also matthias for pbi tools which is very very useful for people to uh forget changes and other stuff like that um for oh, pbx absolutely. files as well i i could have kissed matthias the day that he published power <laughs> bi tools yeah uh shout, shout out by the way he uh, he's finally an mvp now um happened as of in the last month so he did get his mvp this year uh, at, which was like no-brainer obviously for microsoft but um congrats as at least uh, to him for getting a well-deserved uh, mvp for a really really powerful enterprise tool yeah and it it seems like uh microsoft is seeing and listening to some of the work he's doing and yes um <laughs> and all i'll say is for anybody who's going to be at sql bits uh, there is going to be a really interesting and um, important presentation that he'll be doing on next Friday, a week from today, that I'll be very excited to attend with some announcements that are coming there. That, that is all I'll say for now, but I'm, uh, and I don't even know what's actually gonna happen. I've just been told, do not miss this session that I'm presenting at. Uh, so yes. I'm wait, <clears throat> waiting I, with bated breath for that uh, for, for next week. I, I heard the, the same, uh, don't miss it. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm also very excited. Will, will you be at I'm Bits? Be, I'm, okay. I'm not going to be there in person, but I uh, imagine that I'll get to hear some of the details pretty soon after that presentation is done. I'm sure the Slack channel will, will be uh, quite, 
quite very lively <laughs> uh, after that presentation. I mean, I, but, I uh, expect I can yeah. probably watch on Twitter as well for some for some slides in real time. Yeah, just just people posting on LinkedIn and Twitter uh, <laughs> images from the presentation, one hundred percent. But what I like to do uh, as well for like some of the conversation today, so like, what what are uh, as far as the approaches for like lifecycle management, things after um, yeah, you know, after deployment and everything. Uh, it sounds like both one you have a lot of good practices for that, and there there's a tool that uh, I've at least seen a a bit of a, a preview on that you've helped build to solve some of these. But what are the um, what are some of the pitfalls and pain points that you see that that come up through either mismanagement or uh, or issues that happen um, you know post publishing that uh, kind of start start the narrative with some of the best practices and solution that we'll be discussing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even before getting into to pain points, I'd like to mm -hmm. lay a little bit of groundwork because sure. operations is not something that gets talked a lot about in the, the BI space, especially. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the industry trend has been to, to minimize it. So uh, if you'll let me, I'll, I'll do a little bit on why I think this is important. And I'll, I'll start sure. with a metaphor of a space mission because people show up for the same things in software and for space exploration. People show up for the launch. People are most excited on launch day. And the thing is, the launch is a very important event, but it's just the very beginning. The thing that happens after the launch for space exploration is the entire point. The mission is the thing that is getting funded. The launch is just a necessary thing to happen to get mm -hmm. to the mission. And similarly, for software, we celebrate launches of products so much more than we celebrate a long tenure of a successful product. You know, no one is out there saying, oh, good job, Power BI, for having existed for seven years. People are out there saying, look at this month's feature release, because we care about features and launching. And don't get me wrong. Obviously, we need to launch something for it to exist. We need to launch for the mission to happen. But most of the work is actually happening after. The valuable work is what happens after launch. The, the value of a Power BI report is not in the development or the launch of it. The value of a Power BI report is supporting a business to be able to make better decisions through data. And so what do we need after we've published a report or after we've published a data set? Those are the things that uh, really end up taking up a lot of time. People rarely need to pull all-nighters because we're a day behind in development. But if something goes down, and it's mission critical, we tend to have to pull an all-nighter to get it back up tomorrow or work on a weekend. So even though we yep. don't talk about operations as much, production is the thing that gets prioritized. If production goes down, everyone's having a bad day. If development stops for one day, that's not too big a problem. Agreed. And I think as you said too, the the if nothing happens other than the launch and then the essentially the, the mission is ignored, what you <laughs> you built is a very expensive rocket that never gets used. Um, yes. And Microsoft at least kind of reminds you about that. When you get that scheduling refresh has been disabled because no one has looked at this report, I feel like that that's, it's a very, you know, Microsoft does it because it just saves the money. Um, but it's also mm -hmm. like, it, it feels like a passive aggressive notification. Like your report is unused and kind of worthless. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. been looking at this, even though people have said they have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it should ideally you know, uh, be able to run for years and years. Um, I recently just had to step back with a, a project where they wanted updates and um, I hadn't touched that for four years and it had ran the entire time. I think maybe once or twice a year, I get a transient refresh failure issue because I'm still on mm -hmm. the, the admin email, but it's there's a little bit of like, I'm, I'm glad it's been running that long. Like it's, it's not needed an update. The data has just been good and it's just continued to work. So like you get, that's a lot of ROI. If, if the, the report's been running and being used for that long, especially considering the average cost of building any of these for sure. Absolutely. And I, I think first off, uh, since I've called out a, that as an industry, we don't necessarily celebrate long tenured solutions. The first thing I need to do is say, great job, man. A four year running solution with no need for maintenance. You did yeah. really good work on that. So yeah, it, first off, uh, props it, it, on thank that. You and yeah. It's, it was fun to kind of step back into it because there's a bit of also like, I'm, I was, I was good four years ago, but I'm definitely better now what I do. Just I have four years of additional experience. And there's a few things where you're looking around now trying to like, oh, mm, I would do that differently now. Oh, like that's okay. I, I wrote, that's how I used to write. Okay. I wrote tax that way. So it's, it's nice to at least like if anything ever makes you cringe on an old report that you built, 
you know, it, it, a little bit of that is just, I take it as a silver lining of, hey, if, if that looks bad to me now, that just means I'm this much better today than I used to, be. you know, so I've, yeah, I've you learned some skills. Uh, but it, it reminds you kind of like where you've been. It's, it's a snapshot of your practices at a moment in time. <laughs> it can be humbling for sure. Yep. Or just like the aesthetics that you used to you know, do on certain things. Like, oh yeah, that was kind of a popular thing four years ago to, to format the titles that way or do something like this, given whatever the software limitations were as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that analogy. The uh, um, you know, life after launch, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we know T minus three, two, one, but there's a whole lot of T plus as well. And we don't usually hear T plus, but that is the time of the mission, the time of production. We got to count that in, in souls, right? As, as they usually do with NASA. SOL. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, which, which is yep. just like a solar cycle or something. But yeah. Mm hmm. And uh, you also touched on a couple of other really interesting points, though. Uh, Microsoft turns off refresh schedules sometimes. Mm -hmm. One of those cases you mentioned is if no one's using the report, but that takes a while and they don't warn you that there are inactive reports in your tenant. They don't tell you what's not being used until they turn off the refreshes. But there, there are yep. other times that Microsoft will turn off a refresh for you, uh, doing you a little favor. And okay, uh, I, I'm um, curious that if anyone in the chat knows uh, what is and, and, a scenario and, where they'll turn and off And this refresh. is where it will actually toggle off the scheduled refresh. Just like essentially yep. the, the, okay, so, hmm. I've not known of others, but I'm just trying to think of a scenario. And yeah, if anybody throws it into the chat as, as a thought, I'll, I'll pop it up onto the screen. But yeah. uh, the only so, other things that I can think about might be related to large data sets or something else where they're, a timeout issue would just fail it though. And you would get a, a, yeah. a refresh failure, not a scheduled has been disabled. So mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they also I, don't necessarily send you a notification when they disable it. But if it fails four times ooh, in a row okay. on a scheduled refresh, yes, the fourth right. failure notification is a little bit different and then you stop getting failure notifications. So you can easily assume it may have just been transient. I've had a lot of customers who have had data sets that fail, whether a source went down or they did something incorrect in their logic and data came through that caused errors. But if your refresh fails mm -hmm. four times in a row on a schedule, that schedule gets turned off. And I can see, see how, yeah, I could see how that could become a problem. Cause I mean, normally when I see those schedule refresh failure emails, um, if I see one or two, like, I, I wait to see if I see more than one before I actually mm -hmm. go look at it. Cause it, especially if it, if nothing's happened for six months, one single blip comes through that usually just something got gunked up in the chain. Um, maybe that the server was being hit too hard on with something else. Um, so I ignore it. But like you mentioned, if you get a few of them and all of a sudden you just stop getting them again, you think it might just have fixed rather than yep. actually, uh, it should be a, they should send an email with a high priority status to say scheduled refresh has been disabled. Nope. You get four emails in a row and then you stop getting them. So if it happens over a weekend and you've got a busy Monday or say it happens mm -hmm. over the course of a couple of days when you're off, you get four emails, you come back, you're sorting through all those emails. You might just see a couple of those say, okay, well, I don't have any from today. So things are good. Then a week or two yep. later, hopefully pretty quickly, someone's going to complain about stale data, but that's no guarantee. So out, and the only way I've ever done it is with Sentinel because that's the mm -hmm. uh, that is a tool that shows you what's what's what data sets have disabled refreshes what and what data sets have refresh failures. Um, but how do you yeah. approach like in a in a tenant looking for that information? Because like, especially in, in the, the the standard portal in Power BI, I think you really just have to go hunting and searching for for a kind of a manual combing process to find them on any workspaces that you're you're in uh, charge of. And if you want, yeah. I, I can so, share your screen. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm pulling up yeah. a, a very creatively named workspace that I, I work in. And I've got a greatly, uh, wonderfully named data set here. And within the Power BI portal, uh, this is, they'll also send you the failure emails like we just talked about. But within the portal, if you've got a data set, you'll get that little red triangle notification. It'll show up in the various workspace screens. And if you go to the refresh schedule or the data set settings, you can open that up and you can see that there are four failures in a row. This thing last refreshed on the 13th of February. But besides hunting and pecking or keeping an eye out for those little red triangles, there's no way in the portal to see that there mm -hmm. were four failures in a row. You have to open it up to see that there were four. The little red triangle just tells you that there was one. 
You can also see all of your refreshes in the admin portal on capacities only. So if you've got anything on a uh, premium capacity, an A SKU, an EM SKU, or on PPU, that will show up under this refresh summary. And I believe this is, uh, you've got to be the Power BI admin or the Office 365 global admin. So relatively few people will see this. And you can see the, uh, the outcomes for the most recent refresh here and a couple of aggregate statistics. Um, like the average duration, the total number of refreshes per day. I can expand this out so we'll see everything. And we can see that fail. And we can see its last refresh was on the 13th. We can see its average duration was uh, 8.05, but we don't see that there were four. So those are the only ways uh, that within the portal you can see those uh, refresh failures. But all that data is available. There are plenty of, uh, there are APIs that give you all of the information that's in Power BI. And so when we talk about operations, one of the traditional things that you would do in operations is deal with logs. And so all of these refreshes are logged. They're available through uh, the refresh history API. And I'll drop that uh, link in the chat and you can call this and you can get uh, the most recent seven ish days of refreshes. The retention period on refreshes is a bit fuzzy. It, they will keep up to 60 refreshes or the last seven days, but I've seen with most uh, things that I look at that you don't get a full 60, even if there are that many in a week. So the, the limitations are fuzzy, but you at least get a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, you get essentially what you see in the workspace view. So if we open up, I would say drop, drop the link one more time. Uh, YouTube's very picky. If you're not a moderator, you don't get a, it, okay. it deletes your links, but I just made you a moderator. So now it should paste through. There it there is. And I see. Yep. The, Excellent. The nice little wrench. So I, I appreciate the promotion. <laughs> so use, if use we the power uh, wisely. Yeah. So if we, if we go back to the, the workspace and we look at that, uh, data set refresh history, the API allows you to get whatever it's showing in this little screen for a refresh history. And you can do that for any, uh, for any data set that exists in a workspace that you've got permission to. And so what you can do, if you call those APIs, you can build yourself a nice little refresh monitoring report. And you can see all the refreshes that are happening for every single data set, for every single workspace. Mm -hmm. And we saw that that thing had its uh, most recent refresh was on the 13th. So I'll just give this um, 35 days of history. And I know that that was in my Greg Dev workspace. And we can see some stuff that's going on in here. There's a whole bunch of that. Uh, there's another test data set in there, this DQ test thing. I'll just uh, filter that out. But here we can see the refreshes of that failed data set. And we can see that it refreshed for a while and then it stopped. So this data is available. You can centralize this. You can look at all failures across the entire tenant. So if I clear all of these filters, I can just say, what has failed in this tenant? What are the, the data sets, regardless of what workspace they live in? And so the data is there. It's just a matter of capturing that and presenting it in a nicer way. And I think Power BI is kind of cool in that it is a data visualization tool. So it allows us to visualize very easily its own data. The only hard part, is getting all of that data. So this is an API call that you have to make per data set. And you have to store history for longer than seven days if you want a longer history. And so, I mean, what we're looking at here is specifically Argus, the, the product and the company that I co-founded. But you don't have to buy from us to get this. This data is out there that you can call those APIs. What we offer is just a turnkey solution to be able to do this sort of monitoring. But you can see, the, the history of failures, you can see everything that failed in the last couple of days. There's a lot of stuff that you might want to know about refreshes in Power BI. Um, another couple of limitations around refreshes are the uh, timeouts. And you mentioned that uh, earlier. We've got timeouts for pro and premium. You can have up to 120 minutes of refresh time for a pro workspace. You can have up to 300 minutes of refresh time for a premium workspace. And after that, Power BI will automatically fail that uh, data set refresh. And so another useful thing you might want to be able to see is, you know, what's slow? What are our slowest refreshes? And if you've got something that's ticking up toward that 120 minute mark, that might be something that you want to look at uh, either 
upgrading to a PPU capacity. Maybe you want to uh, look at incremental refresh instead, or maybe you just need to optimize the queries. Uh, maybe you're doing too much in Power Query and you need to push some of that back into a database layer. There are lots of options to optimize, but the question is, what should we optimize? And if you collect this data and aggregate it, you can be very data-driven about what needs attention in Power BI. I agree. And sorry, I uh, recently just had to change my mic for some reason. My other input stopped working, but I'm back at least. So the I, I would like to just mention as your turnkey options for some of these, where it really is. I'm not up. hearing you anymore, Reed. Okay. The the audio is one sec. All right. So <laughs> then. Apologies. It looks like we've got a couple of uh, technical yeah, yeah. issues on the stream. Everyone. Stream stream can hear me. It's it's you can't. But I'll fix that. While Reed is working on his audio, I think, you know. Mm -mm. Oh, stream can hear him. I can't. Here we go. Now you should be able to hear me. All right. I've got you again. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the software that I run this through all of a sudden just stopped working. So I'm just doing a couple quick little <laughs> dial adjustments. Thankfully, I've done this enough that I can do that. I'm going to pop up my noise gate to help get the background off. So I was just going to quickly mention. And there we go. Perfect levels. So. The, the turnkey solution idea with, as you're talking about, is, is how I describe a lot of these um, tools for people. Like the API is, API is available for anybody to access if they want to go build their own, but that can take a lot of time um, mm -hmm. to build out reports and stuff like this. So as with any SaaS product, it's just a matter of like, hey, is, are, do, do you want to basically have a plug and play option that you pay some, you know, a few dollars for a month? Or do you want to, you know, go have a developer of yours spend 30 to 60 hours building something out. So it's, you know, where, where's the, the, the cost and time are worth it. And um, I, I think that usually at the end of the day, unless you're an enterprise client with a larger team that can go build out everything from scratch, most companies mm -hmm. uh, are probably just gonna want uh, some plug and play solutions, at least until Microsoft offers any um, more robust solution, which is still gonna take a long time for those. So it's good to have these available. Uh, it at least allows for e easy management and integrations without needing to hire additional developers or coders to go build something uh, completely bespoke. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm in perfect agreement on that one. Uh, it, it's, it's why I built this in the first place. Exactly. And uh, I, I like the fact that it's, it, it gets the, uh, much more of the lineage too, because it's writing to a data set. I, I think the, um, the new admin workspaces gets, is it 30 or 60 days? For... For, for 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 monitor for monitoring and built into the, the Power BI, uh, I don't know what the retention period is for the the preview stuff that that's coming out. Because um, that, that you can, the new the new metrics button that you that you get when you you uh, you know open up the the report metrics. Yep, I I do not recall what the new retention period is. I can tell you what the API retention period is and mm -hmm. the old uh, the old. Um, report usage uh, report was 90 days. The API okay. is 30 days of user activities. But I mean, that's a <laughs> actually shoehorns pretty nicely into a, another thing I, I'd like to talk about today. You can drop the screen down if you want a little bit. Uh, we don't yeah, yeah. need to look now. There you go. Um, but usage monitoring. So Power BI does have the, the built-in uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. report usage and that is getting uh, a new preview version right now and they're enhancing a couple of other uh, monitoring reports but the uh, they only track report views and dashboard views uh, they don't track all of the other activities people can do in power bi so that's you can see no okay okay you can see who's viewed a report and that's mm -hmm, certainly mm -hmm. interesting and they've got um something that they don't expose through the apis but they've got page level views in that uh, in the monitoring report. So you can see what page someone has uh, opened in the preview one, uh, but you can't see uh, visual interaction and that's not available via API at all. The API will give you report open, but it won't give you the page view, at least not yet. Uh, okay. I would ex I would expect that with the enhancements they're making to the built-in uh, reporting, they're probably gonna add that page information to the API uh, because most of, most of their built-in reports end up surfacing the same data that the APIs do. And I, they continue to add features to the APIs as well, um, which, which has been good. Uh, that's actually yeah. something that I thought was really cool talking to, to uh, 
to, to Alex Whittles is um, that when he's noticed their gaps in uh, monitoring um, ability where certain metrics weren't available through that, uh, the nice. nice part about being an MVP is you have a channel back to the uh, um, to the team. So I, the community I've seen of a lot of MVPs uh, like Rui or Alex or others who do any kind of usage monitoring and are accessing that a lot, uh, they've helped the, the team realize what gaps there are in data that should be allowed to be exported uh, for those monitoring purposes. And uh, it, it's grown, which has been really good. So I, I think they're, um, it's becoming more robust as we're seeing a need for being able to monitor certain statistics related to the portal. Yeah, I, and they're definitely enhancing things, um, sometimes more quickly than they update the documents. So there are, there are definitely things that I've seen where there are uh, yep. data elements learned from the API that are not documented in the API docs. And uh, sometimes it's, it's really fun to guess and check and figure out <laughs> what something might mean. Exactly. Um, and I've just, I don't know, I, I've been very appreciative, I think, on all facets of, of Microsoft with Power BI and just the, the community driven changes that, that have uh, continuously um, evolved with it. Um, just as one random tangent, of some of the recent updates to see even the custom visuals API that, that's come out through a lot of partners that they've had. And um, again, like, hey, we've noticed a gap and like we need to be able to do this with, with the, the container. Can you please add this in as, as a function? And cool, yeah, we'll, we'll look into yeah. it and uh, we'll, uh, we'll make the the code base more robust to allow to for you to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, or like uh, all of the PBIX hardening that's been going on for a while now to support external tools. Um, for example, Tabular Editor, which is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. another shout out um, for absolutely critical tools. I think uh, if there were saints in the Power BI world, that would probably be uh, Darren Gosbill, Daniel, and uh, and Matthias for PBI Tools, Tabular Editor, and Dax Studio. And uh, one other shout out I'll give as well as to, I'm gonna get the link to this, uh, is a Didier, Didier. <clears throat> he does PBI side tools. Um, oh it's like yeah, a, that one's it, also. It, yeah, I mean, yep. it, it's, it's an external tool of external tools in a way. I mean, it has like a plugin for a bunch of other stuff, but it, it there's so many micro tools in it, but at the end of the day, external tools are the best ones are usually the ones that were built because the person who built them wanted it for themselves, like DAX Studio. Yeah. Darren needed a better DAX editor. He built it for himself, Tabular Editor. Uh, Daniel yep. did not like having it <laughs> develop um, in desktop. So, you know, he, he built that to, to start allowing for robust solutions. So it always starts usually as a personal project for like, hey, I need this for myself. Um, oh, mm -hmm. other people might find this useful too. Yeah, well, I know uh, I was talking to Matthias once and PBI Tools was used, he used that internally at his company mm -hmm. for years before releasing it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was just a, it didn't even have a UI at the time. It was just a basic auto automation mm -hmm. tool with a couple of scripts. I think uh, using like PowerShell or something originally uh, way, way back yep. when. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, he, he's he's honestly probably one of the reasons that I started getting into Visual Studio Code more is uh, that tool plus a few others. Like, okay, I really should, I really should start actually using Visual Studio Code more than I do, um, <laughs> um, and it, it's it it doesn't have the stink of traditional Visual Studio. That's one reason I avoided it. Just like wait, Visual mm -hmm. Studio takes fifteen minutes to load. Why do I want Visual Studio Code on my computer? But it, it's an entirely different beast. But it it, it took a minute for me because I there is a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths of old school Visual Studio and just how system hungry it is. Oh, absolutely, and uh, especially for uh, for SQL Server data tools. Uh, which you needed for analysis services or for uh, reporting services or SSIS, that thing was another yep. Yep. very bad layer on top of Visual Studio's bloat. And the the day I found Tabular Editor was a, a breath of fresh air, being able to edit uh, a tabular model without having to wait 15 minutes to see the tabular mm -hmm. model. And yeah. just basic changes. Uh, it's even things that, and it's a fun part of some, because I don't have my software, I'm having to slowly tweak my gains a little bit. So I, th I think I should be good now in audio. Um, but let me know if it's still too quiet uh, in the chat and I can add a couple more notches to the gain here in uh, vMix. But <clears throat> the the one thing that I, I missed at least with Power Pivot, and it still doesn't exist in Power BI Desktop, is the just the fact that when you open up the Manage Measures window in Power Pivot, it, it pauses, changes to, to the model. Yeah. Like, uh, you, you can write a bunch of measures, and when you click OK, it basically commits. It processes everything else. Yeah. And you, there, there's no 
may need to do that in Power BI Desktop. Like tabular editor is the only way to do that uh, today. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's the you know, pa pause changes until you can script it. Because if you have a large model that, you know, opening and creating a new measure, that might be 15 to 30 seconds of just waiting each time you kind of go through the process yeah. of that. And it's, it's annoying. So, so it's those little things that, you know, just saving you small seconds here or there, batch, copy, pasting, um, bind and replace, and all, all the other stuff that's, you know, you can do a SQL code. And, that's just not really mm -hmm. easy to do in desktop so yeah absolutely and i think it you know it, it, it speaks to the the pattern of microsoft tools which is essentially microsoft builds great platforms yep and sometimes the tools to use those platforms are not quite so fully baked as the platforms themselves <laughs> uh, yeah and it, it, exactly and then they, they end up just relying on the community itself to, to build mm -hmm. the build the missing pieces um yeah. But at I mean, least they're, Microsoft yeah, and, uh, they've always been, a, they've always embraced their partner community. True. Very, very, very true. Um, I, I think it, it's definitely, they've embraced it more openly, <clears throat> certainly in the last, you know, since external tools became an option and because mm -hmm. at least now it can plug and play more directly uh, with those versus yeah. having to do a bunch more standalone installs. And it felt like it was, a, it was kind of reserved much more for the, super expert crowd versus the intermediate crowd can now use them uh to a degree uh, a lot more intuitively yeah. um, i mean well that yeah. that's actually a divergence from microsoft's norm with with power bi uh typically microsoft has always had quite well specced platform artifacts and it mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. they've always depended on isvs to add functionality to the platform and power bi was sort of the exception like we still don't have a, a formally specced pbix file format Nothing external to Microsoft is. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is I mean, I'm I'm uh, going through PBI that pain point. Start. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm going through that pain point right now because I'm developing a, uh, a bookmark document or external tool mm -hmm. um, that kind of both prints out not only the the relationships and the settings and everything, but also the filters, which is really hard yeah. to pull out of the code. And like I'm I'm also like I'm not the one writing uh, most of that. Like I'm getting a lot of help from. From Didier, uh, who's actually helping me to parse out the JSON, and it is from as he's described, it's quite challenging to print that in plain English, whatever the code is is explaining for you to understand mm -hmm. how it's being uh, documented in the model, um, but also that it, it exports accurately every time with the 85 different types of like filter configurations you can do between the filters pane and cross and all that. And there's there's no documentation on on the structure. You just mm -hmm. you got to go, you know. T take a sifter and look through the sandbox and try to find everything inside of there. And we're fingers crossed that, you know, in tw two to three years, the the uh, uh, the JSON schema uh, structure does not change and everything just breaks, you know, yeah. on, on this stuff. Well, so. I mean, two to three years, there's no promise even month to month. Yeah, I mean, it, it did they, they did a massive overhaul to the new structure two, two years ago. Um, so yeah. I, I think there's at least hopefully a bit of a safety net to think like that's a decent spot that we have a, a, hopefully a few years of lead before they do any major changes versus just incremental changes um you know but um yeah it's like there there's there's always that risk with anybody building stuff that uh, extracts data especially from the um uh, the, the model json files <laughs> and um, any kind of documentation built out of that it, it <clears throat> i have I'm discovering the how hard it is to to get information out of there it is it's not a it's not a clean data export at all. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's uh, it, it keeps the days interesting as these changes come out. But mm -hmm. I am looking forward to the day when the the file format for a PBIX is formally spec'd because there's a uh, there's a lot we could do if that is formally documented and spec'd and also stable in version. Yep. I mean, it's the part of that process of continued desktop hardening and exposure of easy management of that and hopefully also the you know um the more of a ci cd uh, ability um uh, continuous integration continuous development for uh for models that i know tabular error can do that thing where it automatically uh breaks out in folders every single piece uh, of, of the model mm -hmm. for for individual changes but I, i've honestly I, it's been around for years but I've, I've never actually done it myself yet like i would expect maybe you have considering your oh yeah that's uh, uh, but but it, absolutely it's, required for large models Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for 
<clears throat> for for super large data sets. Like the closest I've gotten is just you know imagine the bism file and like keeping that separate mm -hmm. if you need large data sets. But I've I've never gotten gone as far as doing the actual folder parsing of every single individual piece of that, which which does that you know, explosion separation uh, of them. But I do know that for for large scale data sets in enterprise, it, it is occasionally used. Um, it, but it, it, again, for like being able to do the um, multi-author development uh, between certain components and doing uh, isolated changes without <laughs> breaking other parts of the model. It's yeah, still not I mean, like, that's officially a... supported. No, but the that I feel pretty comfortable with because the BIM file is formally specified. So True. as long as you have a program that reliably generates a valid BIM from those pieces, and that program is Tabular Editor, as long as you can reliably create the valid BIM that conforms to the specification, you're good to go. But there is no formal specification for the PBIX. So there's no way to build the program and test that it always creates a valid PBIX because there is no public definition of a valid yep. PBIX. The closest we've got is whatever Power BI desktop will open. That's That's the sort of circular definition we have right now. Yeah, I mean, does it open it and does it, you know, does it not throw a warning? Okay, cool. It yeah. recognizes this as a stable file. But even then, like, I mean, up until recently, uh, <clears throat> you know, for years you could you could have a file with a with a bad theme that um, mm -hmm. partially worked and it would open it. And they they did crack down on that a few years ago, where there were a lot of reports that all of a sudden broke because they 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 hardened the criteria on. Um, uh, quality themes that were in there. And I, I had a few themes that I did not realize were bad themes until uh, I opened one day and all of a sudden a bunch of headers and all this stuff started breaking. Um, but even yeah. then, so that, that validation wasn't tried and true because just because it could open it, there still might be problems with it that it wouldn't recognize until it started throwing random errors if you tried to interact with something or a page just looked wrong. Yeah, and I mean, that's uh, one of the nice things about working with the APIs for the operation side is that the APIs are documented and stable. Additions are either non-breaking or announced in advance. The, mm -hmm. the difference with PBIX file and anything that you're doing in Power BI Desktop that is not Power BI Desktop itself or uh, some of the external tools that use only the uh, uh, the official APIs to interact with the, the PBIX file, those things can break without warning because there is no promise that they will act in a certain way. So. It's nice to have the API surface area for things that are in the service, because if there is an API for it, that is stable. That is a promise from Microsoft. And if it changes, that's either going to be announced in advance or it's a bug. If <laughs> yeah. some internal behavior of Power BI desktop changes that you depended on, there's no need to announce it in advance because it's internal. And if it changes, it's not necessarily a bug because there was never a promise of what it would do in the first place. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm. I try to be careful on uh, implementations or anything else where there, there if there's a certain feature that like it provides some workaround or something else that I, I'm not 100 percent sure if that's a bug or a feature. I mm -hmm. at least now um, can check with the team like, hey, if I, I'm I'm doing this thing this way. It's not really the way you're supposed to, but in six months, is this something that you're aware of and you're going to be patching? Um, so <laughs> I I've, I've done that a few times. Like as an example, the just for, from a visualization perspective, the you can technically add conditional formatted uh, markers onto a line chart. So you have to start mm -hmm. with a bar chart. You conditionally format the bars when you convert it to a line chart. I, I, this is exactly how I stumbled across it. It changes the colors in the bar to little dots in the line, but those those dots are also colored. There's no way to edit the conditional formatting on the line chart. There's no yeah. F of X button, but they, they show up as perfectly colored little, little circles. And that was like, hmm. Okay, well, if this was officially supported, there would have been an F of X button on that. So I, I did check with the team, like, so one, I'm going to let you know, just I want to make sure you're aware that this is a thing. But two, if I if I deploy this to a customer, are these going to disappear in a few months? Like, no, we're just we're not going to ever add the F of X button, but we're never going to delete this. There's enough people that have used it, so like, okay, it's a it's a safe bug to implement, but at least it's not going to be a patched bug. Um, but the, I think there's you know. For experts like us, that there, there's definitely a transparency that needs to happen with things like that, or even modeling changes, where we, we want to make sure that the we don't end up implementing something that might break down the road for a client, uh, especially with that gray area and limbo of uh, bug bug versus feature. Yeah, well, and I mean, I, I say all this, and I say be cautious, but 
I absolutely use Tabular Editor instead of Power BI Desktop when I'm editing models and want to make bulk changes, but that is, most of that is not supported. You have to click the scary enable unsupported features button in or Tabular ex Editor. Do. Experimental features, or is it unsupported? Uh, experimental, but yeah. that's just a kinder way of saying unsupported. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, there's go, there's go no ahead. official path to do it, but I do it anyway because it allows me to do things either faster or better or that I can't do in desktop. The, the great example is when calculation groups were released. The official documents said, if you want to use these in desktop, you can use a third party tool such as tabular editor. Yeah. I mean, it, it is on the, the roadmap now to have the option to add those eventually directly from desktop, yeah. which, will, which will be nice. Um, the one that I, I don't do a ton of experimental ones. Uh, I think you, you do probably more ones related to automation rather than adding an experimental feature to the model necessarily, uh, I think. But well, the, the experimental <clears throat> features are yeah. tabular editors, experimental features. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the things that like, and mo honestly, a lot of them are safe to implement, like um, probably more than half, but it's mm -hmm. just, they have to say that because you get, you have to protect your, you know, the, the, the product and that Microsoft officially d it does not let you do this. So it's like, you leave it to you to check blogs to make sure that other experts have said it's okay to implement. But if, you know, if, if the one in a million chance it breaks, if you do like open a support deck with Microsoft, they'll be like, nope, we're not going to help you because, mm -hmm. you know, that is a unofficially supported feature. Uh, the one that I actually d did recently is I had a client that wanted a single value input for um, like, let's just say product ID. They wanted to be able to yeah. type in a number on a page, have it filter to an ID. Single value slicers only work with what if parameters. There's no option. Yeah. And it, it's annoying, right? Like that's, I think mm -hmm. that's a practical slicer type, which just it's a little input field with no slide or anything else, just let you input one value. You know, it's a design choice for that. Yep. Um, so you can go into tabular editor. Uh, there's a property that you can set on a column that basically mm -hmm. tells the model, this is a what if column for the what if parameter, and then you can use that slicer type. It's unofficially supported. I've never found anywhere online that's ever had a problem doing this with it. Uh, even SQL BI's blogged about this, mentions that it's mm -hmm. a um, experimental feature, but I think that's perfectly fine to, to, to implement. And I I don't think there's ever gonna be a problem if your model breaking because you changed this attribute on a, on a, on a numerical column on your product table. Uh, but that yeah. is one of those, you know, Microsoft will not support that if you do it just because it is, uh, um, it's something that's outside of the scope of what you're supposed to do on your model using mm -hmm. the you know, official tools. Yeah, I have used tabular editor before to create a calculated table. And the, the nice thing about tabular editor is that you can create things without the code executing. So when you create a calculated table in Power BI Desktop, it, auto, it immediately and automatically mm -hmm. calculates that table. You can write the DAX in tabular editor and save it into the model. Okay, okay. And, okay. and it won't necessarily refresh it immediately. So will you just have an empty table or? E okay. Yes, because that's what would happen. There's a, when you're dealing with tabular models, there's a specific type of refresh. Um, refreshes are called process in tabular vernacular, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's called process calculate. And that will recalculate anything that is calculated. And I was able on an occasion to define a calculated table that used today's date. And if you have a calculated table that uses uh, today or now, or <laughs> yep. a couple of other- uh, a couple Yeah, of those other are annoying. Functions that are not, um, they're not stable. Their value changes uh, when you call them. Power BI Desktop will recalculate the calculated table when you open the PBIX file. Okay. And I was able to save a calculated table into the PBIX that then errored when the PBIX was opened and errored in such a way that Power BI Desktop itself crashed and you could not actually get back in and access oh, no. via tabular editor or via Power BI Desktop oh, no. to actually change the thing. So I did break a PBIX once. Okay, that's... Because I, I, I made a calculated table and I saved the PBIX before the table was evaluated. And yeah. then when I opened the PBIX, it evaluated it and failed hard. Oh dear. That's luckily that's a sad place I keep backups. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, 
I mean, at least thankfully versus the Excel days, the amount of times where I've corrupted a PBIX file, I can count on one hand. I could yeah, it's very count rare. on many people's, many, many, many people's hands, the number of Excel workbooks that I've corrupted. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I, I, there's one thing I just want to call out on that, um, specifically related to the, using the today function. So it, that's a little bit of a, I, a unique beast in the model because today in tables, like if you use it in a calendar table or in a measure, every time you open the file, it refreshes. Once it's in the service, it will only refresh during scheduled right, refresh. Right, but refresh. It, it, yep. it's also confusing to some people because I've had a lot uh, who think that it just it refreshes every time you look at the report because that's just how it behaves in desktop. Uh, but because of that, honestly, like I, I usually have a last refresh disconnected table in my model with like one row that mm -hmm. refresh date. Then everything yep. that requires today is anchored to that because if you open a, a a report a year later, the pages are probably all going to be blank if it's filtered to anything relative date because everything got recalculated on the calendar table to this year. All the data is still from last year, so then you can't even look at like mm -hmm. the historical report anymore. Um, it's because sometimes people archive uh, the the file for you know just looking at the previous data for some reason. Um, so it's really tricky to work with today, and it, it does frustrate me that it, uh, especially in calculated tables, measures. Sure, that makes sense because measures are calculated on the fly. But if you're using that in cached data that mm -hmm. is in the model, the fact that it refreshes upon open has always been a uh, an annoyance of mine, I think, just because it behaves yeah. differently in the service. And it's one of the few calculations that behaves differently between desktop and service on, on when it uh, is processed. Yeah, that's uh, I actually learned about that with that PBIX file because I had understood that calculated tables are only refreshed and always refreshed when the model is refreshed, which is yeah. true, like you said, in the service. And I did not even know that it was redoing it when you were opening the PBIX and desktop. So I also learned that that day. I think most people find out the hard way with this. Like they open a file later, like why? Mm -hmm. I didn't, I haven't refreshed this. Why is this uh, like all of my data missing? And yeah, it's, yeah. it's a, and then you realize, oh, I have to go back and basically re-anchor everything, usually to like a manually entered uh, you know, date, time, local now, uh, power query table mm -hmm. that uh, um, anchors to the rest of it. Uh, I do have a question um, related to an earlier thread that I was going to pop up from uh, Pitious, if I can pronounce that correctly. So uh, earlier there was mentioned the structure of PBX files, if that will change. And I said that, uh, um, if that'll happen, um, how would the service read the old files? Um, how will Power BI desktop open? So I, I think that kind of almost like a backwards compatibility, it usually any new version of the software, if it if, if eventually the, the, the schema changes, it's it just reads both. So like Power BI desktop still reads the old and the new, um, but it's just that new reports will be, and data sets will be built off the newer, uh, more optimized structure and configuration. Yeah, I I do know that the um, Power BI Desktop is much better with uh, backward compatibility than forward compatibility. <laughs> so sure. you can you can almost always open an old PBIX in a new version of Power BI Desktop. I'm not aware of any situation where that has not worked. Yeah, uh, but it, it may, may be possible. I would actually love if someone had archived PBIX files from 2015 that we could experiment with. But usually, I mean, they've already well, got I code that knows how to open. <laughs> An old file yeah uh, so they can continue carrying that code forward but the thing is and this was much more frequent back in 2015 to 2017 a month or two would pass and they'd make changes to the pbix format and if you edit with july's power bi desktop june's power bi desktop might not be able to open that same file the forward compatibility is a lot better now so you can usually get away with having a uh, several month old power bi desktop installation and interact with and collaborate with someone using a several months newer version of Power BI Desktop. But that's the sort of uh, change direction that is much harder to account for and needs to be built into the file format specification so that an old version of Power BI Desktop knows here is where things might change and I need to be able to process anything I see there. And processing that might mean ignoring it. So you might have an old version of desktop that simply does not implement some features, but can read the file. Mm -hmm. And that's that's forward compatibility. If you've got a version of Power BI Desktop that cannot open a PBIX because the PBIX was edited in a newer file, then that's a failed 
forward compatibility. Backward compatibility is a newer version of Power BI Desktop can open a PBIX from an old installation. And I think the, the backward compatibility ones, and it's been a minute since I've done this, but I think it, it either asks you to upgrade to the latest model because it does that auto conversion or it mm -hmm. does it for you automatically. I think one of the, one of the two, it's been yeah. years since I've had to do that, but I, I do know that there's a pop-up um, with either the request or the, like, if you, if you want to make edits to this file, you need to basically convert it, um, mm -hmm. versus just what's ever in the service. But I, I know there's at least a prompt to like, yeah, you're opening a file that was <laughs> built back in 2015. Uh, we, we, we encourage you to please update to the latest optimized uh, model schema structure. <laughs> um, I actually yeah. had the exact scenario that you mentioned about forward compatibility. So I was working on a government project that um, uh, had um, on the the machine that needed to do the publishing. It was running on a uh, an IT approved older version of of Power BI Desktop uh, that did not have field parameters at the time. But there was mm -hmm. quite a few requests that like this is going to be so difficult to build without a field parameter. So I had to open it on another requisition machine that did have a later version um, and then move it back. And when you open it, uh, interestingly enough, like the, the slicer and the field parameters don't work. Like every all the visuals are still there. Uh, it still recognizes like the, the, basically the table because it, it, it still has like all the rows. It just doesn't do any switches and you know, nothing mm -hmm. changes. But when you publish it, it, all the data is actually still in the PBX and it gets published and it works in the service. So that was an, an actual success of forward compatibility. Desktop yeah. did not recognize the field parameter, but it, the data was still in there and it still published the data even though it couldn't render it on the report page. So it was able to do a pass through between from it created a newer, went to an older and published from an older into the web. So it was nice to kind of, it was the first time that I needed to, to go from newer to older and then online. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very happy that that worked. Yeah, I, I'm very happy to hear that. And I, I have to imagine that's part of what they've been doing with PBIX hardening is making sure yep. that they can do that because part of the, the challenge and part of the reason that we don't have that file format spec yet is that as soon as you make that file format spec, it's a promise. Yeah. It's yeah. harder to add new features unless you've built a way for new features to exist within the same spec, mm -hmm. even if those features have not even been thought of yet. And it's, it's a, a very difficult challenge. Um, I, I honestly have never done something like like that that will allow for future features that are as yet unimagined but still allow an old version of the of the program to operate on that file in a it's safe a series way. of connected interconnected islands essentially yeah. they, they and they have to be dependent but not dependent at the same the same time so yeah I got, I'm, I'm sure it, it probably would have been done earlier had it been as easy um, mm -hmm. so but yeah it's a it, yeah. hard problem it's mm -hmm. Microsoft did something very similar with um, Office file formats, actually, back in the day, moving from doc to docx. I mean, they're the old uh, zip files. They're just all zip files. Yeah. Well, the old ones weren't quite. The, yeah. the ones without the X ex extension were essentially memory dumps at first of oh, the state okay. of the program at the time that you saved. And so it was just all this raw binary data that was very oh. specific to Microsoft Word 95. And yeah. it, it moved on Same. from there. It started to get more formally specified. But then the, the big change was they needed to actually abandon. Well, they didn't abandon them. You can still open a .doc file or a .xls file. But they, they stopped the development of features that were supported in those files. And mm -hmm. the new development was all going to the X versions, uh, the XLSX, the .docx, and so on. Because the old, yeah, the old file formats were insufficient to support forward compatibility. Um, yep. PBIX gets the X, but it didn't get the, the same design time that the original file of the original office formats got. Exactly. It's been uh, but it is very now. interesting. Yeah. Um, as we are uh, getting here up on time, is there anything else as far as any of the, 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 the portal or client management, um, as far as that, like after launch that uh, you want to finish off as any um, open threads? Oh man, we've uh, we certainly have gotten a little bit far afield, but I, I think um, <laughs> some good conversations though. <laughs> yeah, I, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I think the big things is, are when we talk about operations, just uh, generically in software, there are a lot of things that are traditionally needed, and sometimes it's not called operations, sometimes it's called system administration, but it, it's all the same general umbrella. 
and the sorts of things that we need to, to track and monitor in traditional operations for software are storage, logs, configuration, things like uh, resource utilization. So mm -hmm. things like CPU or RAM available. And all of that is required. It's necessary before we even get to something like, is the solution doing the right thing? It's, it's purely in terms of the underlying resources that are utilized by the solution, but it's, it's not even specific to the solution itself necessarily. Uh, and the question that I think is really important to ask is, do these things matter for Power BI? Mm -hmm. And they sort of do and sort of don't. Some of them more than others. Mm -hmm. Logs are absolutely critical. Things like refresh monitoring or user wow. activity, it's available via the APIs, it's there and it should be tracked. Um, things like storage, you have effectively unlimited storage. I know that there are limits, but they've always been very softly imposed by yeah. Microsoft on how much data storage you can have. But things like RAM are, are limited. You don't have an allotment of RAM, but RAM is limited per file or per data set. So you still yeah. have to deal with RAM limitations. CPU is sort of unlimited for Pro, but very much limited for premium capacities. In, in, anytime you have right. anything dedicated, there's a yeah. lot more that needs to go into the management of that to make sure that you are uh, um, not hating, you know, uh, capping that at, at 80% or above and then realizing that all mm -hmm. your fourth chicken five minutes to, for a slicer to, <laughs> to make a selection. Yeah. And so the, what, I'd, what I'd say is when we ask about do these things matter for Power BI, it's generally yes. We do care about how big a data set is. We do care about what's configured, what exists, and who has access to it. We do care about how large something is in memory. And with premium capacities, we care about how much CPU it takes to do certain operations. So I think it's really important to just circle back to the, the story of software as a service is you don't have to worry about operations. But the real, the reality of it is you do have to worry about operations. You just don't have to worry about provisioning the machine. And yeah. so I, I encourage people to take that mindset and approach when working with Power BI solutions. You've deployed something, but you still need to know who has access, who's using it, how much space does it take, and is it doing the right things? Important considerations, I think, to have. And as you, like, just as the point from the very last uh, sentence is, is it, doing, uh, is it doing the right things at the, at the right times? And yeah. where can you spread out the resources as well? Um, I think it's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a really good one. Um, it's one of my key takeaways, I think, from a lot of the new uh, management is people have a tendency to schedule uh, every refresh at like midnight and then wanting to know why they're, they're seeing massive spikes uh, being hit against any of their servers or capacity. So, <laughs> yeah, um, that's actually uh, yeah. Uh, that's a, a report I'm working on right now for uh, an addition to Argus is actually not by data set, but by data source. Okay. So we can, via the scanner API, map every single data set back to its data sources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, if you'll uh, pull up the screen again, we can actually see for any given data source, what are all of the data sets that consume that data source and where do they live? And so I can select any data source on the left side over here and see the data sets that use it and where they live, what workspaces they live in, what are the downstream reports and also what are the downstream users. And so the, the report that we're working on now, I don't have a draft to show, unfortunately, but um, doing refresh by data source. So looking at the refresh times of every data set, which we have from refresh history, then saying each of these data sets has one or many data sources and being able to say how many refreshes are ongoing for this data source concurrently so that we can do things exactly like you said of look at backend database load. Are we slamming? Uh, a database, whether it's an Azure SQL database or an on-prem uh, relational database, are we slamming that with refreshes all at the same time? Could we spread those out? Because like you said, people just schedule everything at midnight or schedule everything at 3 a.m. And yeah. if it needs to be ready by 8 a.m., we could probably spread it out between midnight and 8 a.m. And so being able to look at the refreshes by data source, not just by data set, we can say, here is the actual load being imposed by Power BI on these backend data sets or data on these backend data sources. And I really like the ability to be able to cross filter between all of these because starting from a data source, seeing the sets going up, starting from a user, seeing what they have access in the back, it allows you to oh, basically absolutely. 
do the um I forget the name of it. It's that chart that, that kind of shows the breakouts and, and, and the, the, the the changes uh kind of the street stream of uh, of data, um, which I always see in infographics, but I never actually see any of those like the often in Power BI. But the mm -hmm. the the de dependency flow of this stuff I think makes it really easy to um to get a nice monitoring of touch points across oh, yeah. sources, sets, reports, or users. So I, I like this a lot. Absolutely. And I mean, this is uh, one of my favorite reports just because it shows off cross-filtering in such a nice way. Um, you can select a data source like we just saw. You can also say, what's everything that's contributing to a specific data set? So I could select a data set and see all of its data sources yep. as well as its downstream users. And a quick question from from uh, George. Is he, uh, he, he imagine this shows cross workspace linkages? Yeah, it, yep. it doesn't matter where the um, where the data set lives to know that it's related to the, to a report. I don't know offhand if we've got a data set that's being used across multiple data sources or across multiple workspaces. Um, I'm not seeing any with some quick clicking around, but yeah, it, cause it uh, should because uh, either way that that data set has a link to because like the report's going to have a data set ID next to it, regardless of the workspace that it's in. Um, yeah, so that should be we do, lineage. We do capture that. So let's look for that's in a personal. Have you sorted by cross workspace reports? I think uh, that would just pop up. That's, the top. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking for some of these oh. that are not in personal workspaces. Here's one. So we can look at Monday Power BI. Data copy. Huh. I guess that one doesn't. I don't, I don't want to search around for this. But yes, we do have those yeah. those interlinkages, so we can show. Um, which workspace the reports live in. I don't want to hunt around for one on the stream, but uh, that data is absolutely stored. Every report is tied to exactly one data set. Do you have a link to go check out um, the, uh, I guess the, the SAS tool here? Yeah, this is um, Argus PBI. It's the product and company that I co-founded with uh, my partner, Brent Lightsey. And right. we have a turnkey solution for Power BI monitoring. Um, it's one-time configuration. We deal with all of the APIs. We provide these reports to you. We also deal with things like persisting those um, API results for longer than Microsoft's retention period. So That's the big Microsoft one, yeah. has up to seven days of refresh history, has in the API up to 30 days of user activities. We keep it for as long as you need. Yeah, I love it. And like it allows you to you know see you know, like year by year and anything else where you can you can watch changes over time and especially how the you know <laughs> usage and, uh, and adoption um, can grow hopefully for the organization. But this is great. You know, tur turnkey solutions are very good, and it's it's also nice that it's basically like a one time setup and it just it just runs. So yeah, love it, seeing more things like this into the space. So I'm glad you were able to to spin something like this up. And Brent's great too. I need to need to get him on at some point um, as well. <laughs> so I gotta. Got to bug him to, to do a, uh, a live stream with me. I'll, I'll hit him up later. I talk to him every every once in a while. Perfect. Um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, Greg, this has been fantastic. I, I'm happy to have you on. And I also think that um, I'm excited to, you know, to see what kind of partnering <laughs> is going to continue to come for, for desktop in the next, uh, you know, well, at this point, like four to six weeks um, with some hopefully <laughs> fun announcements here at, the, at SQL Bits. So excited for yeah. that but um yeah thank you for taking time out of your friday this has been really fun i enjoyed the conversations quite a lot yeah thanks thanks for having me it's it's been a blast yeah and uh, everyone thanks for all the great questions and, and uh, chats and comments in the thread um and otherwise uh, I'll, I'll be off for a couple of weeks um next week i'm going to sql bits and then I'll, I'll be in denmark also delivering a training um partnering with used and uh and orange orange theory is a work it's it's uh it, it, Orange Man, um, his company, Orange Man, uh, doing a two-day advanced Power BI visualization training in Aarhus, uh, where his hometown is. So I'll be there. That would be awesome. Yeah, super excited for that. But yeah, I, I won't be back until the 24th of March. And then after that, that'll be my next live stream. Um, Klaus, yeah, awesome. OK, so I'll see you in Copenhagen. Yeah, I finished my trip presenting at the data Saturday.
So I, I sequel nice. bits, then a uh, basically a private training, um, and then later that week in Copenhagen at a, at a presentation at SQL Saturday, then fly home. So I, I have a vacation and, and a lot of fun little work events all in about a 14 day period. Yeah, that'll be a busy but great couple of weeks. Exactly. Looking forward to seeing a lot of people. Um, everyone, enjoy the uh, uh, rest of your Friday and weekend, and I'll see you all online soon. Thanks, all. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. And if you want to help support this channel, take a look at our channel memberships or our merchandise store for cool swag. And last but not least, please consider sharing this video on your social media platform of choice to help our channel grow. So, until next time.